Well, welcome to Chester Baptist Church Bible Fellowship Study for October the 6th. And today, we're launching something new. First, we're going to be taking a three-year journey through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, to see how Jesus is located and seen in every book of the Bible. In addition, our format's going to be changing somewhat as well. Today is the first of several roundtable uh, lessons that we'll have throughout the year. In the future, we'll have one-on-one -on -one discussions of Scripture as well as our familiar teacher-oriented lesson. Good morning. My name is Michael King. We're glad you joined us. Hi, I'm Michelle. Hi, Paul Riding. Brenda Riding is half. Uh, Alex Ware, the loud one who talks a lot. Now, since we're starting with Genesis, I think it would benefit us to understand a little bit of what we're studying. So Hebrew literature is stripped down and light on details. However, like English, it's a very flexible language. For example, in English, we can make nouns into verbs, verbs into nouns. We take proper names and make them common names, and we can create words on the spot. Hebrew is very like that which makes it very difficult sometimes to understand what's being said. We can also uh, say that Old Testament literature is like wisdom literature. Well, I have a question. What, what do you mean by wisdom literature? Good question. We ought to define our terms before we go. So in the Old Testament, it's divided up into meaningful sections. Uh, we have law, we have history, we've got wisdom, we have major prophets, minor prophets. Okay. Um, and these are relatively modern definitions uh, to help us navigate through scripture. Wisdom literature, for example, usually includes Proverbs, Song of Songs, um, maybe um, Ecclesiastes, Job, and once in a great while, Psalms. Okay? So by wisdom literature, we mean that it needs to be read, spoken, contemplated, reflected upon, and applied to, for use any use whatsoever. And again, details are scarce. So if you run across a detail in Hebrew scripture, pay attention to it. Okay? Pay attention. All right. So as Dan Kimball says in his book, How Not to Read the Bible, when you open the Bible, I want you to grab your passport because you're going to a land that is totally different from you. Totally different in customs, society, society rules, all these things. Also, you need... Yes. Well, so oh, you say it's going to be something different. I mean, it's not, not only a different location, but it's a different time frame. Is that going to be a relevant part of our study today? Not to, Yes. Today? Yes, it will be. Right. Very good. I like that. All right. Also, because we're going a little bit of a deep dive, we need to grab a Hebrew to English di uh, dictionary as well as a Greek to, he to English dictionary because we're going to a place that does not speak English. And this is no package tour. We're going to be set down in scripture in places in the middle of nowhere, far from places that we would even think about. We're even going to meet some very unsavory characters along the way. Sometimes um, it is hard to understand what's going on. So I tend to refer to a book by uh, a man, uh, two guys named Douglas Fee and Doug Stewart. They wrote a book on how to read the Bible for all it's worth. And they have two principles that I, that I tend to adhere to. A text cannot mean what it never meant to the author or the original audience, and God's word is the same to us as it was to the original audience. In other words, God's word does not change. Does not change. All right, you ready to get started? Let's uh, feel free to ask questions, and I'll have some questions for you, and maybe, just maybe, by the end of the lesson, we'll have learned a little bit of Hebrew. Okay, here we go. Our core subject today, our core scripture today, excuse me, is from Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, and then 15 through 25. And since it, it is impractical, in my opinion, to do a video of a 60-minute lesson on YouTube, I'd like to focus on three words today that not only do I think will help open the scripture to reflection and meditation, but do the same for the entire Bible. All right? So here we go. Our first word is slightly outside of our scripture block, okay, but it's important nonetheless. So let's take a look at Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. And God said, let us make mankind in our own image, in our likeness, 
so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the animals, and over all the creatures that moved along the ground. The God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So I think by looking at that scripture, uh, a key word is image. What's an image? Is what is meant by image? Yes, Alex. So I would say the first idea of image would be like a picture. I mean, you know, we say image, okay. we, and even back then, at this would be they would have murals, they would have paintings, I think they would have paintings, yeah. statues. This would be what they would say as image with the reference to that specific there time. There you go. It, that's good. So today might be a little. That's good. Yeah, following that's good. following up on that, uh, when you say image. That's one of the, the things that God said that we should not make any false images, mm -hmm. which means something that can be seen, touched, felt. Uh, so that's a, kind of a different way of looking at an image. The Good. false image of God or Jesus or God, mm -hmm. not necessarily of anything. Right. Because they would have the artificial animals and stuff. They'd have they statues, have, yeah, little, yeah. little figurines. Figurine, yeah, yeah, they'd have those. All right, anybody else? Very good. Okay. It is a interesting word, I think. An interesting word. Now, one way to study scripture is to see what word or words are used in the original language. Okay. And then look for other examples of that in scripture. Okay. So, one tool that I tend to use for this is uh, biblehub.com's interlinear Bible. Okay. Uh, it will show you the verse in English. It'll show you the verse in the original language in English letters, so you can see what it says. And then it'll also show you it in the original script. It'll also give you the, uh, a dictionary meaning, and it will show you how many times that particular word appears in Old or New Testament, depending on which one you're looking at, uh, and where to find it. So you can see that word in context. Okay? In, now, the word that we're talking about is a word uh, is selim, Okay, that's the that's the Hebrew word selim. Can you say that selim? Selim. Selim. Okay, that's the word. Can you say selim Halloween? Halloween. Halloween. Image of image of God. So now you've learned some Hebrew. Okay, very cool. Now, since dictionary terms not, don't necessarily do it justice to the words, especially if they're in context, okay, they're out of context, excuse me, uh, we need to see where it is in other places in the Old Testament. But here's the problem with this word. It appears only 16 times in the Old Testament. So we really don't get a, a, a real feel for the context of this word. So we're going to have to go with a dictionary definition. Actually, I think what you've come up with is a little bit better. Uh, if we look up in a dictionary, we find likeness as an image, okay, uh, as an image. Um, and it's been a cottage industry for 5,000 years. People have come up with things that they think is an image of God. Uh, let me just share one of the more complicated ones. Uh, this is from John Walton's book, uh, The Lost World of Adam and Eve. He has four items under the word image. Okay. He says the image of God is, uh, refers to the role or function that God has given to us, such as our command to rule and subdue. Okay. Uh, he has given us an identity, okay, who we are. He's given us a job, if you will, to be his substitute here in the world. And he's also given us a relationship with God, okay, with himself. Uh, G.K. Beale, in his book, Biblical Theology of Idolatry, uses these uh, categories extensively, if you wanted to read that book. However, it's, however you want to define the word, it is important to understand that every human being is an image of God. Thus, we don't need to make images, false images, if you will. We don't have to. All you got to do is look around. Every single individual that we see is the likeness of God, is an image of God. So we don't have to make any. We don't have to make any, okay? They all have a connection to God. And if there's a vertical connection to God, 
there is a horizontal connection as well. Okay. well wait, wait a minute. Um, what, what do you mean by vertical and horizontal? Ah, very good. So vertical, this way, okay, is the relationship you have with God and God has with you. Okay, that's pretty simple. A horizontal relationship is a little more complicated because a horizontal relationship is between you and an individual or you and individuals or an individual and you or individuals and you. Yes. Would that be when you're saying this, would that be like the individual and the church family? Any individuals. Any individuals. Any individuals. Whether believer or not. Correct. This connection. That Correct. Okay. It, it, that's what we're talking about. Okay. Um, let me let me relate to you some New Testament scripture. Okay. We're going to take this out of Matthew chapter 22. Right. Jesus replied when he's asked, "What is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it: love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments." Now, note where he takes these from, okay? He takes these two commands from Deuteronomy, that's the first part, and Leviticus, the second part, okay? Each is dependent on the other. In other words, the relationship you have with God is dependent on the relationships you have with others. And you really can't have real meaningful relationships with others unless you have a relationship with God. So it doesn't matter whether it's church family or not. It's the individual relationship that we have with people. So you're saying it's more relevant to the relationship we have with God, and that affects the vertical relationship affects the horizontal relationship. And the horizontal relationships affect the vertical. Absolutely. I was going to say the horizontal one, if you have bad input coming in, you're not going to have much input out now, there. Well. And when you do that, what have we just made? A cross. Ah, a cross. Very cool. Right, very cool. All right. Now, as an aside note, as an aside note, I want you to also, again, notice where Jesus draws these two from. Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.18. Two very distinct books. They're not close together. They're not the same book, which tells me something. It tells me that I can't camp out in my favorite nice little area of Scripture, and that's where I'm going to live. I need to know it all. I need to study it. All right, so let's just sum up here. Image shows that we all have a connection and a relationship to God since the very beginning. Very good. All right, ready for the second word? Let's move on. Our second word is a bit out of order, still within our scripture block, okay, but it's a bit out of order. It's Genesis 2, 21 and 22. Okay. So the Lord God took a deep, uh, caused a deep sleep to come over the man. And he slept. God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that point. Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. All right. So if we take what is the word rib, what is that, what is that underlying Hebrew word? Okay. And that's Salah. Salah. Okay, can you say that? Salah. 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 So we have Selim. That's an image. And Salah for the rib, if you will. Now, that word is used 87 times in the Old Testament. But here's the kicker, right? 85 times, it does not mean rib. Only twice does it mean rib. Once here, and again, in Deuteronomy, when Moses is relating to that story to the children of Israel. The other 85 times, it's translated as side. For example, side of a hill, a side room, side of the tabernacle. A side of the temple, etc. Okay, it means that. Okay, so that's what you know. So that is the rib. So how did side get translated to rib in this? That, that's a, that's a good question. Okay, so we have Hebrew, silah. Now, as Jews would move from the from the uh, promised land, if you will, from Palestine out into the Gentile world, they started to lose their ability to understand Hebrew. And so around uh, the mid third century BC, a Greek version of the Hebrew Bible was commissioned, called the Septuagint. 
Okay. And from the Septuagint, they put it in the Greek and they use, for whatever reason, the word rib. Okay. And that was in use for quite a while until the fourth century AD. In the fourth century AD, theologian Jerome said, you know what? This is the Roman Empire. We don't speak Greek, we speak Latin. So he created the Latin Vulgate using the Septuagint into Latin. And that Bible was used in Europe for over a thousand years. You can see the tradition is there. Okay, very cool. All right. All right, so now one way that I look at this script is that God didn't just take a rib. He took a side of an atom. That's, that's how I see it. And in my mind, it's like half an atom. That way of looking at the story helps me understand Adam's reaction to Eve in Genesis 2, chapter, uh, verse 23. The man said, this one at last is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. This one is called woman, but she was taken from the man. Not just bone, but bone and flesh. So I see that as a side. Interestingly, God used Adam's side, I think, for Adam to recognize himself in Eve. She was bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. Okay. And that was the only way I think that Adam could be whole was to be paired up again with Eve. Eve was built from Adam to solve the problem of Adam's loneliness. Adam's relationship with Eve was a type and a shadow of the relationship that God wants, I think, with us. We need to be paired with God. The only way I think Adam could be whole was with Eve. The only way that we can be whole is with a relationship with God. Now, how God made either using a rib, bone, or a side, how he made a person out of that, that's a mystery. I don't know. Okay? You know, God seldom tells us how things are done. He tells us what's done. But really, does he say, well, I'm going to do this and this and this and this. This is recipe. He doesn't do that for us. Okay? Ultimately, I think what it comes down to is faith and trust. Do we trust God to do what he says he does? Do we have faith to believe what he tells us? Okay? Uh, and for me, again, this speaks of relationships, just how we view others. Uh, for example, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife and they become one flesh. I used to think when I read this, this was only about procreation. Okay, we got a command, multiply and be fruitful. So it is, this is having kids. But when I started to look at the word and now it becomes a whole person. Yeah, we still got kids going on here, I think. But now I think it's about how to become a whole person. And when we look at that, we have to ask our questions, uh, a question such as, are we incomplete? without God? Uh, are we as an individual absolute? Are we, abs are we all complete? Or do we lack something in our lives? So, sum up. Image shows we have a relationship with God. Uh, and Salah tells us that we need a relationship, a, a bonding relationship. Yes. My question, I have another question, but I have a lot of those. Um, so we're saying that uh, the you're making a comparison that the relationship with God and us is kind of similar to the relationship that we have with a significant other when we create a bonded marriage. Um, or or you together. could have a best friend. Uh, we could have family members. I mean, I, I, I see it branched out. I see what you Branched mean. out. I just, I was trying to. Yes, I, using, using that scripture. Yes, it's, it's man and a woman. Yeah. It's marriage. Creating the marriage. But, but I think it's it's more important, uh, it's, more broader than that. Sorry. It's sort of a relationship. We need a true give and take relationship mm -hmm. with each other and with God. Kind of like image. Yeah. <laughs> kind of like image. Ooh, wow. Look at that. We tied that together. Okay. Let's look at our final word. Okay. Our final word. Okay. But before we do that, I want to ask you a question. Okay. So there's no spoiler alert here. I think we all understand what happens in the garden. Yeah, yep, we've had that one. So we got Adam, Adam, Eve, Ava, 
human life. That's what the words mean. Okay. And we have a third party, the snake. Okay. The snake is going to pick one of the two to subvert. Why does the snake pick Eve? I think, I think, <laughs> I think that he out. picked her because he felt like Adam, which, or you are the weaker vessel. Mm -hmm. And I think that he wanted to have his chance of being successful. So he picked her. Picked her because she is more vulnerable. Okay. I, I can agree with that. I think the point of being the vulnerable part is the fact that she was made from Adam. God created Adam First. from himself. He from the ground he created him. dirt. And then he said, Okay, I'm now going to create from Adam this other to be his his partner, if you will. Right. And so I think that, you know, what Michael said, absolutely kind of all right, this one's not the first one. So maybe I can corrupt this one easier by doing that. I think. Okay. Interesting. She could have just been, I don't know, around. <laughs> he just happened to be there yeah, at the same time. Yeah. Target of opportunity. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. Okay. Well, they were they were together. I mean, many times theologians, preachers mm -hmm. and all will say, well, Eve was out there by herself. And so he just, you know, he chose her because, you know, she was not being defended by her husband. But the fact is that the Bible says that Adam was with her. So now the question is, why didn't Adam stand up ah. and say, wait a minute here? We'll this get is, to that. You know, you got problems with you talk to me. We'll get to talk that. to the hand. <laughs> yeah, right. But I don't think the garden's that big. I mean, it's not the size of Manhattan. Okay. okay. It's not, you know what I mean? Uh, we, I mean, you've got look at the creation story. You've got the world. You've got Eden. Then you have the garden in Eden. That's God's space. That's where where God where comes down. Right. right. We're just coming out, but God where God walks. That's God's space. Okay. So all right. So um, very good. So let's let's delve into this word okay, that I want to talk about. Right? So um, we've looked at the problem, okay, um, of, uh, the solution to the problem, which is Eve. Okay, the problem is he's alone, right? He's alone. Okay, uh, and we see that in Genesis chapter two, verse eighteen. The Lord said, "It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him." Right. So. The key word I think here is helper. Okay, so what do we mean by helper? All right. So the Hebrew word is azer. Okay, is azer. Can you say azer? Azer. Azer. Look at that. There you go. All right, azer. Azer appears 21 times in the Old Testament. And it can mean helper or help. It can also mean ally or protector. Okay. Yo. okay. I'll ask the question. Go for it. So we're, I mean, without sounding too terribly or some word for that, but as a husband, I am sector of my family. Correct. And I feel that that's an important idea. Okay. But I'm also a helper with right. my family as well. So how we differentiate between the, if you're saying the word means the same thing. Okay. So the way I see it here, okay, and, and I agree that you are a protector of your family as well as a helper of your family, which is a relatively modern concept. It is. It's a relatively modern concept. Okay. Um, so if I if I use the word helper, okay, in my mind, my mind. Okay. Could, it, could it be like provider, maybe? I guess I'm jumping the gun there. Sorry. Okay. Provider, no, uh, okay. not we'll quite. No, okay. no, no. Yeah, it's different. Um, but if I see if I see the word helper, I see a hierarchy. Okay. Mm -hmm. I see someone here, and then someone a little bit further down the ladder. Okay. So if we take Adam being created first, okay, Adam's at the top of the ladder, and then I've got an apprentice down here, or maybe a journeyman somewhere down here, who's going to help me out, okay, who's going to help me out, okay? If I use the word, if I translate Azer into ally or protector, in my mind, I now see an equality, right? I now see an equality, if not having the woman a little above because now she's got a real responsibility for protection. Protection depends on how you see that, right? So now, again, with the idea of helper and and protector, why does the snake pick Eve to subvert? If she's a protector, why does he pick her? 
we've, we've already covered the helper part. Yes, yes, Mike. To be, if we're saying that she is a helper and protector. Okay. Um, you know, again, I'm, I'm. I gotcha. Why would he choose her? Because we can get the protector out of the way, like the guard of this gate. Uh, I just, I guess, I have a trouble understanding the idea of her being a protector. Maybe it's the Hebrew mm -hmm. or the word that's being used, mm -hmm. because you know, as as we've all been taught, you know, the protector of the family, he's to protect the wife, he's mm -hmm. protecting the women to be protected, and women and children first, as, as it were. So this kind of throws me off a little bit with what okay. we're saying here. Okay. Sure can. All right. So what you said, I agree with. So if and I agree with Scripture and you that they're more or less close together. They're working hard. They're working, you know, whatever they're doing, weeding. I wouldn't want to do that, but <laughs> whatever. I'm not a garden person. But anyway, um, if she is a protector and the snake goes after Adam, I think her, her dander gets up. Hey, that's my job. I got to protect. But if he can subvert protector, wily enough get her to drop a guard and the gates up the castle is is open my question as well as your question where's adam why isn't he jumping in whether she is a helper further down the, the ladder of the hierarchy or equal as a protector or ally why is adam not jumping in here something to think about Sounds like he was asleep at the wheel. Sleep at the wheel? I I can buy that. How about you gonna say something? I was gonna say maybe distracted. I mean, if Satan being the snake and, right. and is the ultimate deceiver, possibly, and we don't know this, but I mean said, Oh, well, yeah, I'm gonna start a fire over here. I was gonna run over there to protect the fire. Maybe he distracted. Okay. You know, you can't rule out that he was compliant. With right. the with the idea, um, it doesn't it doesn't say one way or the other. But she was tempted, and by his lack of response, his lack of protection, right, uh, it would show that he was in compliance with that request. Do you see? Do you see a parallel here of the way Adam is acting and the way Israel? reacts to God throughout their history. Adam, as you said, Adam could be distracted. He could be compliant. He could be contemptuous. He could just ignore. Are not all these things what Israel did to their protector, who was God, who was their Azer? So we see a parallel here, a foreshadowing of Old Testament Wow. Okay. Very cool. All right. So this shows this, the story shows, I think, that if nothing else, that we ourselves alone are not strong enough to overcome evil. That we do need an azer. We do need an ally. We do need a protector. We do need a protector. Okay. Do you have any thoughts or questions about today's lesson? Not that you haven't asked any. <laughs> well, it's opened some ideas for me that I thought about. One thing about it, since our protector is God, mm -hmm. he doesn't get distracted. Yeah, amen. He doesn't get compliant right. with evil or any of the other possibilities that we've raised yep. as to why Adam didn't step in. God, well, you know, and that, and here I started to say God would step in. But then God has held back many times when people were tempted. Yeah. He still does because he's given us free will yeah. to decide for ourselves. He gave, what Adam, do. he gave Adam that choice. And that's the test. And we see that test in our lives all the time. We see that, te that, that tree test all the time in our lives. And how we, we react to it is. is very telling, very telling. All right. Um, our next lesson uh, is going to be a traditional lesson. It'll be on chapter three of all. Let's close in prayer.
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful, wonderful day and allowing us to look at your scripture, to look at your word, to peel back a little bit of that curtain underneath so that we can just understand what you're trying to say to us a little bit better. I ask, Lord, that you allow these words, this scripture, to just course through our soul, into our hearts, so that when we go out into the fields that are white with harvest, we can look around and see all those miracles that you're doing around us, allowing us to participate in them for your glory. Thank you, Lord.